lovely to be with you, and um, I can look at you now, because you're looking at me. And what you're doing is what everybody does, you're evaluating me. You're looking at this fellow that's standing here, and you think, I wonder what he's like. But you see, I'm doing the same to you. I wonder what you're like. But it's a real privilege to come and share something of the Lord. I was, let me give you just a little of my background. I was brought up in a Baptist church, and I thought that was the nearest thing to the Bible. I was saved under the ministry of a Welsh Baptist evangelist called Idris Davis in a Calvinistic Methodist church right outside Pembroke Castle. And I was the only one that went forward in that meeting on a Saturday night. And I accepted Christ as my Savior. That was 66 years ago. Wow. When, I was, when I was 15 years of age. So there you are, you can do the maths. And I love the Lord now more than I've ever loved Him before. The Christian life grows sweeter. Not easier. I've got some bad news for you. The older you get, the tougher it can become. I once read the biography, the autobiography of George Muller. It's called A Million and a Half Answers to Prayer. I read it. I used to read it each night in bed, and my wife had to listen to it as well. <laughs> I kept on saying, Nicky, you've got to hear this. And he was an incredible man of faith. Those of you that have read about him know that. But he said that when he got into his 90s, God still kept testing him and trying him. So we will go through tests and trials throughout the whole of our Christian life. If you don't go through tests and trials, you're not saved. And so I, I've been praying, and I thought, what will I share with you? I've got so much to share. By the way, Jim says I've got two hours. Is that all right? <laughs> <clears throat> but I love the Word of God. And I based my whole life now on, on the Word. I'm not interested in experiences unless they're backed up by the Word. The devil can deceive us. He can come as an angel of light. The Apostle Paul gave warning. He said, if an angel... He said, even if it's an angel that comes and gives any other gospel than what I've preached, let him be cursed. And he repeats it. I think he meant it. And so the Word is all important. You'll never develop in the Christian life until you start to search the Word and study the Word and be approved unto God. It's the Word that brings life. And one of the sad things I feel today within Christian circles as I've moved around is that many Christians only read their Bibles superficially. You know, diamonds are not found on the surface. It's in the deep, and you've got to dig into the Word. You've got to study the Word. You've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. The best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. I was baptized in the Spirit in 1963 in a little cooperative hall at West Bridgeford in Nottingham. Never been into a Pentecostal meeting before in my life, and I wondered what on earth I'd got into. But the thing was, I knew that these people had something in Jesus that I didn't have. I knew I was saved. But I could see something. And I simply came to the Lord. I said, Lord, if this is of you, I want. And I based it on the Scripture that the Lord would give me nothing that would be dangerous to my spiritual experience. I was baptized in the Spirit in 63, and I went home to Wales. My parents had a guest house in Tenby, and I used to go to the Baptist church there. And, of course, I went back full of enthusiasm to talk about this baptism in the Spirit. Now, you're talking 1963, and I had uncles that were elders in the Baptist church. Well, I was so enthusiastic about this baptism in the Spirit, speaking to, in tongues and magnifying God, but I got what they call the right foot of fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, God has His ways. There was a retired Assembly of God minister 
who was a caretaker of some flats in Tembe. And my uncle, who was one of these, said, I know someone that's like you. <laughs> and so I got in touch with this, this retired Assembly of God minister, and he looked after me with his wife for 10 months. I had my own pastor for 10 months. And then I went to Kenley Bible College. And, um, my, and my wife, by the way, we met in Germany. I was in the Royal Air Force and stationed in Germany. And my wife, Nikki, who was unsaved, that, that's another story. And, um, but um, the Lord brought us together. It was an, an, an amazing and incredible story. And we've been married now 52 years this, this year. And I love her more now than I've ever loved her before. <laughs> She's my best friend. She knows me more than anybody else. And I thank God for the wife that I have. We, we both are teachers in our own, our own right. It's our gifting from God. And we teach in Africa. We've been teaching church leaders in Africa now for the past 10 years in Kenya, Uganda. David came with me to Rwanda in Kigali and We've had some very precious times in sharing the Word of God. I love it out there because they're hungry for the Word. And I love the Q&As. And I say, you can ask me anything you like. <laughs> and um, if I don't know the answer, I'll try and find it out. <laughs> and I love it because I want, to, I want to scratch where people are itching. Not to just talk about things that they don't really want to know. So that's just a little potted version of my background. We've been down in Poole now for 43. This is our 44th year in June. The 14th, we'll have been there 44 years. I've got my daughter, Kerry, who's a pediatric nurse, and uh, she specializes with diabetes in children. And she's a school nurse at the moment. She established a clinic in Uganda and trained nurses for two years down in the place where AIDS first broke out. And then um, I've got my son, David, who's two years younger than his, than his sister. <coughs> I'm sure we got the wrong ones when we came out of the hospital because they're <laughs> totally different. <coughs> David, is, um, David is, Jim didn't get it quite right. He's a, he's a district judge who sits in Bournemouth and in, and in Weymouth. I'm glad he's become that because when he was a solicitor, he was far too busy, Jim. Now he's got more time. To spend. He's our musician, our chief musician in the church, and um, he's one of our Bible teachers as well. So that's a little background. Now, I'm looking at you all, and, and I just want to share something of Jesus with you. And if you go out of this meeting loving Jesus more than when you came in, I will have achieved something. And after all, that's what we want, isn't it? We only want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, I'm going to do something a little different because I'm opening my message with part of my conclusion. How's that? Just a part of my conclusion, which is probably the most important scripture for Christians in the Bible. You find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's just simply a Pharisee. He's a lawyer, a scribe, and he was asking Jesus a question. And he said to Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. And this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. And to me, the clincher is the next verse. It says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The whole of our Christian faith is based on these two commandments. Loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. I call these two commandments the root and the fruit. And you don't go looking for fruit where there's no roots. And unfortunately, a lot of people do. They look for the fruit and there's no roots down. It's impossible to love a person in the way that God wants you to until you first learn to love him. Absolutely impossible. 
I've heard preachers say, you know, what we want in this church is less gossip, less talking, backbiting. And everybody's going, amen, amen. And they're all agreeing. And then very often when the service is finished, they're at it again, aren't they? Now, what's wrong? All, to, all it is to me is it's an evidence that they really don't love God. We love the Lord, and loving your neighbor is easy. <coughs> Jim was telling me he's been doing studies in Ephesians 3. I've been in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, for about the last year and a half. I got so many sermons on Ephesians. <laughs> it, it, it's just an incredible book. It's one of the greatest doctrinal books in the New Testament, after Romans. An amazing book. But loving God is the foundation of the whole Christian life. I don't care what you do. You can have talents, abilities. You can be an incredible musician, etc., etc., etc. But you, don't, you neglect your love for God, and there'll be problems. They will surface somewhere along the line, and you will have problems. <coughs> Jim was saying in, in Ephesians, it's Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you are what? Rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. I like the verse of Scripture that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3. In the King James, it just simply says, but if any man love God, the same is known <coughs> Of him, but I like it in the Amplified Bible. Listen to it in the Amplified Bible. But if one loves God truly, with affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and grateful recognition of his blessing, he is known by God, recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love, and he is owned by him. Oh, I like that. I like that. That intimate relationship with the Lord. He's the first person I talk to every morning. And I just want to learn to love him more. And as you grow in the grace of the Lord, and you grow in your love for Christ will deepen. I wish I knew what I know now, 30 years ago. But you can't put an old head on young shoulders. Experience only comes by experience. Now, love includes worship, doesn't it? <clears throat> it is. If you really love God, you want to worship Him. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> and you realize that worship is the only thing that you can give to God that He can't take from you. Listen to what I'm saying. He can take your health. He can take your wealth. He can take everything you've got. But God cannot extract love from you. That's the only thing you can give to him. And that is why the Lord is looking for a people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> We've got to watch. Now, I'm not made, on you, when you come into the times of praise and worship, and I've taught on this around the world, see, praise can be empty. Praise can be empty. How many times have you sang a chorus and you're thinking about the meal? Or you're thinking about something else. Come on. It's right, isn't it? Our praise doesn't get past the ceiling. And we're thinking about something else. <clears throat> See, praise can be empty. Worship never. There's no such thing as empty worship. You're either worshiping or you're not. And God looks for worship. A people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I think the passage of Scripture in John 4, when he speaks to the Samaritan woman, and she wasn't exactly the, the best example of a Christian. <laughs> There's this Samaritan woman, and yet Jesus reveals to her what he hadn't revealed to hardly anybody else. He said, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who you're speaking to. He said, the Father seeketh those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. 
let me just leave with you. If worship is shallow, and if your worship is shallow, your Christian life will be shallow. You can pretend. It's one of the things that people, and we're all good at it, we're all good at acting. We're all good at sometimes presenting what we want people to see. But what is in our heart? It's what I am in relationship to my wife and my children. Come on. That's it. And worshipping the Lord is the activity of the heart. I love it at times when we get, and we used to, we sometimes have folk just lying on the floor and weeping and crying before God. Worship is, it's not, it, 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 it's not an exhibition of, uh, it's just people getting lost in God. In love with Jesus and lost in God. We don't want to make a spectacle of ourselves. You see, I draw the distinction between emotions and emotionalism. Emotions and emotionalism are not the same thing. Emotions that are not based upon the truth of the Word of God and understood with the mind can very easily run out of control and cause havoc. Emotions informed by the truth of the Word of God never run out of control. You know, I, when people come to me to say, well, I couldn't help it, I just had to... I said, no, you don't. The prophet is subject to the prophet. Prophecy is subject to the prophet. In other words, we choose. And when we live in truth, truth regulates us. Emotions are controlled by the truth of the Word of God. That's why Jesus said it's truth that sets us free. Not experience. It's truth that sets us free. Truth must never stop at the head. It can only be understood by the head. But truth has to go down into the heart. That's why the scripture says in Romans that we believe what we confess with our mouth, but we believe in our heart. The heart, you see, is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Failure in the Christian life is always based, I believe, on a neglect of love. Many years ago, and I used to watch, and you'd see some men that had incredible ministries knew the Bible from back to front and could give you expositions on the Word of God, and then they failed morally, financially, or the power got to them. And I used to think, what, what on earth is wrong? I couldn't understand it. Some well-famous preachers. And the Lord seemed to put into my heart the key to it, at least it, to my understanding. And I believe that what had happened is they'd been working in their Christian life Preaching, conference speakers, I could name names. But they'd be neglecting their love to the Lord Jesus Christ and their relationship with Him. And you neglect your worship and your relationship to Jesus, I want to tell you, problems will come. Problems will come, and you can be burned. We must never neglect our love relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a part of my conclusion. So you know that I'm going to come back to this later on, and I'll point something out to you. But I want you to turn to the letter of Ephesians. It's one of the Apostle Paul's prison epistles, and it's an incredible book. I always remember years ago, a brother went out on a picnic with his family, and he, he had his little New Testament. And while they were playing, he sat under a tree. He thought, I'll read Ephesians. And so he read through Ephesians. It's only six chapters. It's not a long book. So he read through Ephesians. And as he was reading through it, he said he read it through a half a dozen times. He said, and the more I read it, he said, there was a fire seemed to come up in my spirit. The doctrines and the truths in the book of Ephesians are incredible. See, all the epistles break into virtually the same kind of division. You always get the doctrine. When people say that Christian doctrine is not important, that's nonsense. Doctrine is vital. The truth of the, of the word is vital. Doctrine always comes first in the apostles, in the epistles rather, and then you get the practical application of the doctrine. So you get it in Romans. All the doctrinal statements right up. 
to chapter 11, and then it goes into the practical application of all that you've been learning. Ephesians does the same. You get the doctrinal statements in the beginning in the first three chapters, then he moves on to the practical. I want you to focus on two verses of Scripture out of Ephesians. When I say two verses, just two passages, rather. Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 4 and verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now those are two incredible passages of Scripture. I'm not, I am not exaggerating when I say I could keep you here for a couple of hours on those two verses, on those two passages. Amazing truths that are contained now, it's always very important that one of the great principles of Bible study is that you never take stuff out of, come on, you know it. Come on, you take it out of context and it can be a pretext. The Bible, you always compare the Bible with the Bible. Don't take verses out of context. So we've got to look at the background of this, these texts to get a full understanding of what is going on. Now, chapter 1 of Ephesians explains their position in Christ, which is including us. You're a Gentile. Did you know that? Is there a Jew here? Well, it doesn't make any difference because there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. We're one in Christ. See? But we're Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. And um, <coughs> He opens up in chapter 1. Listen to it. I, I just I run through verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Where? In the heavenly places in Christ. It's always in Christ. That's one of his favorite sayings. In Christ. And Christ is in us. Verse 4. We are chosen. Hallelujah. We are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. To be what? That's why God has saved you. Not to work for him, to make you holy. To be holy and without blame before him in love. I have a, a message on that verse of Scripture alone. Credible passage of Scripture. Verse 5, we are adopted as his sons through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have redemption and forgiveness in verse 7 and, and of sin through his blood. Verse 13, we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. What a position. What a position that is. The key verse to the whole understanding of Ephesians, and for that matter, the whole of the Bible, is in verse 10. That's the key verse. Verse 10 says this, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. This is the key to the whole plan of redemption. God is restoring everything that Adam lost. And it's all in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You see, the whole plan of redemption is based on this. In Romans 8, 22, a passage, a passage you should know, for we know that the whole of creation groans and travails in pain until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves are groaning within ourselves, waiting for what? The adoption to wit, the redemption of our what? Come on. 
I want you to think this through, the redemption of our body. Not your spirit. Your spirit's already redeemed. My spirit is redeemed. I'm seated where? With Christ where? Come on, you've got to think this through. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. My spirit is with him. Come on, that's the whole teaching of Romans 6. That's not speaking about baptism in water. It's speaking about baptism into Christ. What happens? We are crucified with Christ. We die with Christ. We're buried with Christ. And we're raised with Christ. Hallelujah. It's all in Christ. Our spirit is saved, but your body isn't. I don't want to go into heaven with this body. I, I'm 80 years of age, and, and I, I get aches and pains now where I didn't have them before. Because the body is failing. See, my spirit is redeemed. But my body is yet to be redeemed. You get that in, 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 in um, Romans 8. That's it. The redemption of our body. Now he finishes chapter 1 with a wonderful prayer. The two great prayers in Ephesians, chapter 1 and chapter 3. Have a look at his prayers in Philippians and then in Colossians. The prayers, the content of the Apostle Paul's prayers is incredible. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. That's what he's praying for. And that's what we as Christians need. It saddens me when Jehovah's Witnesses can come on doors and Christians can't give them an answer. We need to know the Word. We've got to give a reason for the faith that lies within our heart. Right opposite our church door, we've got the leaders of a Jehovah's Witness. Probably in their 40s. Laurie and Jenny is their name, and... I thought, Lord, I just want to have a, a talk with them, you know. So I stopped him one time out, and he's, they'd come back with their two, two daughters, 11 and, and 8, and, and I said to him, I said, you get some of your people come and knock on my doors, and it's always at an inconvenient time. <laughs> and I said, they always catch us unawares then. They know exactly what they're going to say. And, and then I've got, I'm relying on memory. I don't have any time to think. I've got... So I said, I'd like to come and ask you why you are a Jehovah's Witness. I don't want to preach at you. I want to know what made you become a Jehovah's Witness. He said, yes, I, I do that. I said, you can come into our church or you, in, in our home or your home, whatever. I said, I just want to meet with you. And his wife heard that as she was coming out. She said, oh, that would be nice. And would your wife come along? I said, she'd be delighted to. So we arranged to go to their home on the next Wednesday evening. And Nikki and I went at 7 o'clock, and we were there till half past 9, quarter to 10. And she had not been raised in it. He had been raised in it. And they were asking our testimony. They were asking us why we were Christians. I, did, I, I, I loved that. <laughs> and so we were explaining to them, you know, the, the things and the doctrines and different things. Now, they haven't been saved. I'm still praying that God will really bring them through and that we left something there that will cause them a disturbance. See, whenever I witness to any, anybody who's unsaved, I always go away and I say, Lord, give them a rotten night. <laughs> Don't let them sleep a wink. Convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment and make them feel lousy. You see, you cannot get saved until you're convicted. There's no such thing as easy believism. It's not this business, come to Jesus and all your worries are good. You get more when you get saved. There's got to be conviction of sin. I like to try to be devil's advocate sometimes. I've said to folk, if you're talking to somebody, you say, now you need Jesus in your heart and life. They say, well, why do I need him? See, well, well, he died for you. I didn't ask him to die. You see, you've got to give an explanation. We've got to give a reason for the faith. We've got to be able to explain to people what salvation is all about and why people need to be saved.
Listen to the last verses in chapter 1. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Ooh, it's getting so exciting, isn't it? And not only in this world, but also in the world that is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Good gracious me, what a position we're in. What a salvation we have. That's how much Jesus thinks of the church. Now notice how he starts chapter 2, because he hasn't finished Paul hasn't finished. And in chapter 2, what does he say? Let me get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm running ahead of myself here. And, there it is, and it connects it up to what's gone before. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also, and notice this, the Apostle Paul says, we all, he's including himself, we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I've got a message on that verse on. <laughs> And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But, oh, I love the buts. I love the buts in Ephesians. But God, hallelujah, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, has quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace are you saved by faith. And there we are again. And he has raised us up together with him to sit where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. He starts with this. And he says we're dead in trespasses and sins. Now where did that death take place? Where did that death take place? See, we've got to ask questions of the Scripture. Don't read it superficially. Where did death take place? Now we've got to go back to Genesis to find out the first chapters of Genesis. There's teaching going on, unfortunately, in evangelical churches that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are mythology. They're not real people. You know, Adam and Eve, they're just the, 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 the myth. They're not real people. It's only when you get to Abraham that they become real. And it's like Nikki was talking to a Jew about it, and she said, well, Abraham had a father. <laughs> and he had a father. That's what the genealogies are all about. So what about it? There was one old lady, she was listening to the preacher, and he was on about evolution, and Adam and Eve were, you know, just a story, etc., and a figment, and all so she went up to him after, and bless her, she had a simple faith, and she said, if they're, if they're not real people, could you tell me where God starts to tell the truth? And I thought, amen, hallelujah. Oh, where does God start to tell the truth? So when did this death take place? Now, I, I got to encourage the, Christ, the sisters here. I must encourage the sisters, because you've had an awful lot to put up with us men over the centuries. Isn't that right? Come on, see a nice, healthy amen's coming out now. <laughs> so we go back. You see, you've got to go back to Genesis. That's the foundation of the Christian faith. If there's no Genesis, there's no redemption. You can only understand the New Testament when you go back to Genesis. It's the foundation of the gospel. The Garden of Eden was a temple of God, and he met with Adam and Eve there. And I want to ask you a question. Adam was made in who? He was made in the image of who? Eve was made in the... No. Now, come on. Eve was made in the image of God. See, you've got to read your Bible very carefully. 
Adam and Eve were both made in the image of God. See, God is not male or female, He's both. He's both. I've got st studies on this and I, and I love to go through them. I always love to take the Scriptures and compare Scripture with Scripture. Adam and Eve were both made in the image of God. Now, God had warned Adam, hadn't he? And he said in chapter 2 and verse 16, he commanded him, he said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, because in the day that you eat of that you will surely die. I'll mention something about the surely die in a minute. But notice this. When God gave that command to Adam, Eve wasn't even in existence. She hadn't been created. Why did God not create Eve in the same way? Why did God, why did He create Eve in the same way that He created Adam? He took the dust of the earth, formed the man, and blew the, the breath of life. Why didn't He do the same to Eve? Have you asked that question? Now, everything that God created was good. There's only one area where it says that God was a little disappointed with something. He said it's not good that what? It's not good that man should be alone. So who was instigating this? It wasn't Adam. It was God. He says it's not good that man should be alone. And then he created Eve. What did he do? He put Adam to sleep. And what did he take? Now, you're all going to say rib, aren't you? <laughs> Which is a very bad translation. See, that Hebrew word occurs over 30 times in the Old Testament, and it's only translated rib on this one, this one or two occasions in Genesis. Never translated by that elsewhere. It's out of the side. Out of the side. Bone and flesh. It's not the rib. And I, you, you used to get some nonsense going around that the men had one rib less than a woman. You know, what a load of <laughs> God's wallet. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Is this getting televised? I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but it's out of his side. Eve came out of Adam's side. And when he woke up, he said, this is my bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You see, out of one person, God made two. Out of one, God made two. Now, I haven't got time to go into this. I've got teaching. I, I love teaching this. You see, I believe that there's a total equality between men and women. Total equality. God is no respecter of persons. And there's a total equality between men and women. Adam was not the boss in the Garden of Eden before the fall. If he was, and if he was supposed to be a boss, he was a very bad one. Very bad one. Because, listen to this. Well, first of all, it says that you should surely die. I, I, running ahead. Surely die. In the Hebrew, that's speaking of two deaths, not just one. It's speaking of spiritual death and physical death. So the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they lost contact with God. Their spirit died in touching God. And that was the moment that their physical bodies began to deteriorate. And mutation started in their physical bodies. But it took Adam 900 years to die. Because his genome and his DNA was virtually perfect. And it took time for the mutations to develop right down. If you want a terrific book to read on this, it's one of the finest books. It gave me the answer to the longevity of the patriarchs. It's Professor John Sanford on genetic entropy. The human genome is on a destructive path. And there's nothing that science can do to stop it. Not a blind thing. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. We're on a downward path. There's more allergies around now than there ever has been. 
because mutations are, are, are increasing in the human population. Genetic Entropy by John Sanford. Where did Cain and Abel get their wives from? <laughs> Come on, where? They married their sisters. It's as simple as that. They married their sisters. Their DNA was virtually perfect. Abraham married who? Come on, he was married to his half-sister. But as the mutations were developing in the DNA, then God had to do something. And so when it came to the Mosaic law, he said to Moses, no longer can brothers marry sisters and cousins. Because in other words, the mutations that were developing was causing abnormalities, birth abnormalities, and defects in birth. This has got nothing to do with Christianity. Do you know there's one city in the UK that has more birth abnormalities and defects than any other city in the UK? Where is it? Even the government are concerned about it and they've been trying to do something. Bradford. Why? Because they marry cousins. And there are autism and all different things that take. There was a, a program on there, a young Muslim girl of 20 years of age, and she said, I don't think I'm going to marry relatives. See, God told Moses that. He, he knows everything. In John's book, he says that if two cousins marry, immediately they take 10 years off the life of their children. because of the DNA and the genetics. But I, that's getting out. Now, Genesis 3, here we come. God pronounces judgment in Genesis 3 and affects the whole of creation. For we know that the whole of creation groans and travails in pain. You see, it affected, when Adam and Eve sinned, it affected the whole of creation. And then it says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast. And, of course, he goes to Eve, and he says, he said to her, has God said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And then Eve says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, you shall not touch it, or you shall die. Where, how did she know that? Amen. I want you to think this through. I don't want you to just listen to me preaching. You've got to think this through. Adam, either, either God told her, or I think it's more likely that Adam conveyed that. He says, you know, God gave me a command that we're not to touch of that tree. See? Right? Or we'll surely die. Now, what happened? Satan tempted who? Eve. And she saw the fruit and she said it was, oh, it looked good. And so she took it. Where was Adam? <laughs> now, I've asked a lot of people questions. They don't even know this. Where was Adam when Eve took the fruit? He was standing right by her. So if he was the boss man, why didn't he say, you mustn't do that? <laughs> Come on. You can't abdicate your responsibility, can you? He didn't say to her, Eve, we've been told not to do that. She took of the fruit and ate of it and gave some to Adam, and he ate, ate of it. Now, the incredible thing is, and ladies, take some encouragement from this. I love to tell the men this. <laughs> I do. God comes to them and he says, Adam, what have you done? What have you done, Adam? Oh, he's a, he's a big man, isn't he? So he says, it was that woman that you gave to me. It was that woman that you gave to me. So he's not only blaming Eve now, he's blaming God. So here he is, blaming God and blaming Eve. He got dealt with Satan, but he, he then comes to Eve and he says, Eve, what have you done? Eve's the only one who told the truth. She said, the serpent deceived me. The serpent deceived me. 
Now, I know that she was thoroughly deceived because you get that in 1 Timothy 2 when the Apostle Paul says, and the Greek term there is, she was thoroughly deceived, completely deceived. But in the same passage in 1 Timothy, it tells us that Adam was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived, but not Adam. That is why the Bible says, sin came into the world through who? No. You better be worried. <laughs> sin came in through Adam. Death came in through one. And you see, the one modifies it. The one man. Not Eve, Adam. You see, the serious sin committed in the Garden of Eden was by Adam, not Eve. Yes, she committed sin. But it was no way as serious as what Adam's was. You see, Adam's was a direct disobedience to a command that he had received from God. A direct disobedience of a command that he had received from Almighty God. And so that is why... Let me just give you them. That is why we've got death entering in to God's creation through Adam. For as in Adam all die. In Christ shall all be made alive. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world. You get this in Romans. For if by one man's offense many died. Hallelujah. If by one man's offense death reigned through one, how much more shall life come through the one, Jesus Christ? Therefore, through one man's offense, one man's disobedience, one man's obedience... You get it? One man. You see, death and sin came in through Adam, not Eve. Now, of course, I've heard people, when I start teaching, some people say, ah, what, what about Genesis 3.15? What about Genesis 3.15? You know, you, in, in, your conception will be increased, and in pain you shall give birth, and your husband shall... Come on, what does it say? And your husband shall rule over you. Right? And they say, how do you get around that one? I said, it's very simple. Chapter 3 is judgment. All that happens in chapter 3 is a consequence of the fall of Adam, the sin that was committed. God didn't intend that to happen. He didn't want that to happen. And man, the husband ruling over his wife is a consequence of sin. We know that the first promise of the Messiah comes in this, doesn't it? About the bruising the heel, etc., and all that. Speaking of Christ, thousands of years into the future. So we've got to, we must read the Scriptures very, very carefully. Genesis 3 is a consequence of sin. Sin became rife. Good and gracious, the first polygamy took place with Lamech. And then look at all the mistakes through the, the Old Testament. I mean, goodness gracious me. Men have dominated women, and it's been an absolute... Well, it's, it, it's terrible. There's only one area that a man is superior to a woman in. No one's going to stand up and say, oh, by the way, men are more intelligent than women. Who's going to do that? But there's only one area where a man is superior to a woman. What is that area? Come on. That's it, muscle power. Now, I ask the question, what if the roles were reversed? And the women were physically stronger than the men. It would just revert to them, you see, because sin is sin. They're sinners as well as the man. So the women would be saying, if you don't do as you're told... <laughs> The bottom line is that I'll give you a good hiding. <laughs> Come on, isn't that right? That's right. See, man has used his physical strength to dominate woman right down to the centuries. The Muslims do that today. You think the women would be subjected to what they are subjected to if they were physically stronger? They'd say, Come on, get out. <laughs> They'd never put up with it.
Let me rush on. How much longer have I got? An hour? No. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You see, after Genesis 3, that's the plan of salvation. God is redeeming everything that Adam lost. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. We're going to get a new heaven and a new earth. I don't like this one anyway. I hate gardening. I blame Adam for all that. <laughs> all the jolly weeds and all the rest. Of it. I, I hate it. I'm looking forward to the new earth. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. See? And so he sets out the conditions in the world, he says, in which you used to live. We used to live like that, didn't we? Following the desires of our flesh and our mind and, oh, that's what we were all, we were all terrible people. We're worse than what we can believe. And then it comes to the but God. Oh, I love it. But God, who is rich in mercy. See, salvation is all of the Lord. Amen. But God who is rich in mercy. He loved us even when we were dead in sins. And he has quickened us and made us alive together with Christ. Verses 8 to 10 in chapter 2 emphasize that salvation is all of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Why? Lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, our Lord, unto good works, which God hath ordained before that we should walk in it. Now, from verse 11 to 18, I've, I've got to run through this fast. I'd love to stop at some of this. But it says, Paul emphasizes that the Jews and the Gentiles are one body in Christ. Do you know this? I don't like I, I've got to watch. I don't want to be too strong. But I dislike this business, you know, where they separate Jews and Gentiles. And, and they, these churches are, and they call them fulfilled Jews. To me, that's not biblical. Messianic Jews. Come on. You're either a Christian or you're not. There's no such thing as a Jewish Christian or a Welsh Christian, a Scottish Christian. We're all Christians. It's not race. And you see, the Apostle Paul made his, 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 his place in this abundantly clear. He said, there is no what? Slave or? There is no Jew or Gentile. There's no slave or free. And there's no what? <laughs> Come on, there's no male or female. We're all one in Christ. That's why I believe 30 years ago I came to realize this in my study. And I had used the Scriptures to dominate my wife. And I said, not to dominate, but to get my own way. Do you understand me? I said, now, I said, I used to say to Nick, I said, sweetheart, I've got the last word, you know. I, I, I'm, the I'm the head. See? And she didn't like that. Because we didn't have an answer. I've got an answer now. I, I'd love to take you on that study. I believe this totally. I don't believe in man being the head, Lord. I don't believe that Scripture teaches it. But that's a study on, it, on itself. And I love to do it. I gave this in, where's the brother from Kenya? I gave, I gave this study to the leaders in Kenya and I asked them first of all, I said, hands up those that think that women have no place in leadership, etc., and all the rest of it. And a lot of them put them up. They were ministers. So I said, right, I'm going to go through the scripture now and then you can ask me any question like, so we went through the scriptures. And the brother who was a pastor of a large church, he came up to me after we'd finished the study. He says, Ken, he says, you have altered my whole view on women. And it wasn't the fact that I was saying I got right. It was just the fact that he was prepared to listen to the Word. He was prepared to listen to the exposition of Scriptures that people have taken out and they've distorted their meaning. They take them superficially instead of going into them. 1 Corinthians 11.3 is one that is really abused. Well, I've got to watch, otherwise I will be going over time. <laughs> But, I, but it's true. I honestly believe in my marriage. I apologized to my wife and asked her forgiveness. 30 years ago, I said, Sweeter, I have used the Scriptures. I said, we are equal, totally equal. And when we got married, we brought our talents and our abilities to our marriage. And we become one flesh 
in the sight of God. One. I might have some abilities that Nikki doesn't, and vice versa. But they're all one in the marriage. In the marriage. One. We're bone of bone and flesh of flesh. Hallelujah. And Jesus used that in Ephesians 5. It goes on in Ephesians 5. He says, that's what the Christian is like. He says, we're bone of bone and flesh of flesh. We're married to Jesus. I'm married to Jesus. We're in him. He is in us. Our bodies are temples of not only the Holy Spirit, our bodies are temples of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I've got, I've got to rush on. When we come to verses 16 to 22, I'd like to have spent more time on the fact that the church is one. There's only one body. There's never two church. This business, the so-called dispensation, you know, there's a heavenly church and then there. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's nonsense. There's one church. One church. One church. One redeemer. One mediator between God and man. Now, from verses 16 to 22, there are three metaphors that are used to describe the church. Three metaphors. In verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in what? One body. There it is, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. I was looking at it, I was wondering, why would they not look at it? You're bringing the scriptures up, aren't you? <laughs> I'm just realizing that. <laughs> God bless you, sister. You see, this is, that is between the Jew and the Gentile. There is one body. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The Ephesian church was comprised of probably about 95% Gentiles and a few Jews. There is only one church and one body in Christ Jesus. The Jew and the Gentile have become one. And Paul makes this abundantly clear. He takes the two and he makes one. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And someone says, but there's more than one baptism. This is talking about baptism into Christ. There's only one baptism into Christ. That's the new creation brought about by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the question is this. How does God create this building? This holy temple. You remember verse 3? According as he has chosen you in him before the foundation of the world to be, to be holy and without blame. How does God create this holy temple? In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a, a holy temple in the Lord. And you are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now this is so important to the Apostle Paul that he invents an entirely new Greek word. How about that? He invents an entirely new Greek word that is only used on two occasions in the New Testament. And it's both in Ephesians and it's the verses that I gave to you right at the beginning. The last verse of chapter 2 and verse 16 of chapter 4. That's where this word is found. Not, you don't find it anywhere else. The Apostle Paul took three Greek words and he made one out of them. Because it's so important. And he says this. This is the word fitly framed together. Fitly framed together. The Greek word is sumar melogio. Now my Greek pronunciation might be terrible. Someone said that once to me when I was... And they said, your Greek, Ken, is terrible. I said, well, it's with a Welsh accent. <laughs> but I'm no Greek scholar. <clears throat> but a better translation of this word is this, harmoniously fitted together. Harmoniously fitted together. Fitted together in harmony. The picture is of a stone building. I can remember traveling up through the lake, this and other places, and you see those stone walls? Is there any builders here? <laughs> if you're a builder, you know, the bricks that they get now, they're all the same, aren't they? But that was not the case before. They used to have to shape them. 
and put them in and fit them together harmoniously to build the wall. That's what the word is meaning. The church is God's holy temple. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, be pre will not prevail. The building is being fitly framed together into a holy temple and we're building together for a habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who is shaping each Christian to fit into the church. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit is shaping you to fit into this church, to love your brothers and sisters. He's fitting you and shaping you together. Hallelujah. So that you become united, one in Christ. I love, in, I love Corinthians, one of my favorites. I, I've got so many favorite verses. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is shaping us to fit into this holy temple that God wants for His habitation. Now this is something I want. I want to take you to Solomon's temple. Very quickly, 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 7 says this, and the temple... When it was being built, was built with stone, finished at the quarry. So that what? No hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. They were fashioned elsewhere, and then they were fitted into the temple. You see, the Holy Spirit does His work silently. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit does His work silently. The only other place, as I said, where Paul uses this word is in Ephesians 4 and verses 15 and 6. Speaking the truth in love. We may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, here it is, this is the word again, fitly joined together, harmoniously fitted together and compacted by which every joint supplies. You've got to supply that to the body. What are you supplying to the body? Nastiness? Gossip? What are we supplying to the body? You've got to supply to the body to help it grow in holiness to the Lord. And notice how it ends up there. It says, and we, it says that the body may increase edifying itself in love. So that's where I come back. To love. It is all done in love. And if it's not done in love, it's empty. This building is being fitly joined together and framed together in love. We come back. And this is the question I put to you. And it came to me just a few weeks ago. And I hadn't quite seen it. That Pharisee came to Jesus and he said, What is the what? What is the greatest command in the law? Didn't he? How many was he asking for? One. So why did Jesus give him two? That's the question I asked. Why did Jesus give him two? He said, the first is the greatest. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is like unto you love your neighbor as yourself. You see, you can't separate them. You can't separate them. That's why Jesus had to give him the two. Because when you love God, you love your neighbor. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But there are people that try to love their neighbor without loving God. It never works. Never works. It will always break down. I've seen people come to the altar and, they, and they're confessing their love I, I, and, and until death us do part. And it can last sometimes, what, five years and even less. And they go, what's happened to their love? It's only human love. It fails. It's only God's love that never fails. We build on God's love. It's the Holy Spirit only who can produce this love in our heart. The fruit of the Spirit is what? All the rest in Galatians there is, 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 is offshoot of love. Long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. It's all coming from love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And the Holy Spirit is shaping us and developing us 
This fruit, he's fitting us harmoniously into the temple, the holy temple of God. Peter states the same truth in different words. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, he says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also are living stones being built into a spiritual house to be the holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I can't help getting excited about some of these truths. Jesus said, you shall, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind. It's always the Lord first. And fellowship with each other second. You reverse the order and it's disaster. Yeah. Can I start bringing really to a close? You see, the whole of John's first epistle is based on, first of all, our relationship with God. See, Gnosticism was creeping into the church. <clears throat> Terrible things. And they were saying Jesus wasn't real. He, did, he didn't have flesh and bone and all this. That's what the Gnostics were teaching. And the Apostle John, let, let me just, let me go to that quickly. What's happened to this thing? You can get fed up with them, can't you? When they don't work. <laughs> I'll have to go on memory. Never mind. In 1 John, he says, that which we have handled, that which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He was saying, Jesus was real. He was flesh and blood. It was the same writer, wasn't it? He wrote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so in his first epistle, he says, this is what it's all about. He said, Jesus was real. We lived with him. We walked with him. We saw him. We touched him. We've handled of the words of life. He said, if you want fellowship with us, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And then he says that your joy might be full. Then he goes on. You got it up here. Lovely. Move on to the rest of there. Because he goes on and he says, God is what? God is light. And in him there is what? No darkness. Listen to me now. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And if, what? If we walk in the light as who he is, who's the he? Come on, who's the he? Exactly. Come on, don't change the subject now. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Who's the one another? It's God, it's not us. That, that verse is speaking about relationship to God. And as we're fellowshipping, we, what, what is the blood of Jesus doing? Cleansing me from all sin. Hallelujah. That's sins of ignorance. One of the sins in the Old Testament was the sin of omission. Sins of ignorance. And then he goes on to say, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That whole chapter is about our relationship to God. Loving God. Loving God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Then the rest of his epistle is on about loving brothers and sisters. And if we dwell in love, God dwells in us. It's all about the relationship then to each other. But you've got to put God first. The greatest man of God that I have ever known and I just used to like to sit with him. He affected my wife and I more than anybody else. He's the greatest man of God. If I could say, the Apostle Paul says, be a follower of me, even as I am a follower of Christ. When I, I saw Jesus in this man more than I have seen him in anybody else in my whole 80 years. And that was Howard Carter. Howard Carter. We spent a Christmas Eve with Howard and Ruth and John in the Bible college when it was closed down over the Christmas and they invited my wife when we were at Hounslow and we went and spent the, the, a, a Christmas Eve with them. It was like heaven upon earth. 
Howard Carter was the greatest man of God I've ever known. He penned this. He ran the Hampstead Bible College by faith. He didn't believe in exams. I don't believe in them. If you go to Bible college, I don't believe in exams. If people are not, if they're called to do a work for God, they should be doing their best. If they're doing their best, that's enough. Never mind exams. And Howard never believed in exams. I want to tell you, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones started the Bible college in London. He didn't believe in exams. Didn't believe in exams. You do your best for the Lord. Howard Carter wrote these words. Let me never lose the all-important truth that to be in thy will is better than success and grant that I may ever love yourself more than your service. You've got to love God more than his service. God's after your heart. Have you been born again? Are you being fitly framed into the temple here in Sheffield, in life fellowship here? Are you being fitly framed together with your brothers and sisters? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to shape you, to mold you, to knock the rough edges off and get you loving your brothers and sisters? We often gravitate to the ones that we like, don't we? Huh? See, because we all have our different personalities and we gravitate to the ones that we like. But we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's shaping us and fitting us into this incredible temple. Are you being built together for the habitation of God by the Spirit? I leave you with this. Are you a member of that temple? Are you a member of that temple? Jim? Come and close the meeting, my brother, and I hand it over to you, Pastor.